how does a room full of completely dysfunctional and imperfect people, I'm in front of the list on this, when we gather together in Jesus' name, how does that sound so beautiful? How does it look so beautiful? How are the works of a group of imperfect people when we do and serve and give in the name of Jesus, it's transformational. People take notice. And it's attractive. Today and next Sunday, we're going to take two weeks. We're just talking for a few minutes about the church. Who we are as the church. When I say the church, I mean the big C church and the little C church. The little C church is... Little Boulder Mountain Community Church. We're going to talk about who Boulder Mountain Community Church is. And we're also going to talk about the Big C Church, who is the, the church all around the world. Next Sunday, then, we'll talk about where Boulder Mountain Community Church is going. Where are we heading? What's God have for us in the, in the future? What are decisions that need to be made? And what are some initiatives we're going to go after? So that's next Sunday. I'm really excited to share that with you next Sunday. August 4th, then two weeks from today. Everybody look at me. Sunday, August 4th. You're invited Sunday, August 4th. We're going to have two services, 9 and 1030. The 9 o'clock cloud says? <laughs> They're like ready for a nap by 1030, the 9 o'clock crowd. <laughs> two services, 9 and 1030 a.m. on Sunday, August 4th. We're doing that for you, but we're also doing that for a whole lot of people who are not here. For your friends, for your family members, for your coworkers, for those of you who you know, who may not know Jesus, and they may not know good news, this is an opportunity as we go to, back to two services and to invite them on Sunday, August 4th. Okay? Today, Ephesians chapter 5, we'll look at, as well as a passage, a verse in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. And I begin... This morning, asking a question, how did a first century cult, that's really what it was, birth in the armpit of the Roman Empire, Galilee, Judea, the armpit of the Roman Empire at the time, nobody chose to move there. How did a first century cult birth in the armpit of the Roman Empire, whose leader was rejected by his own people, and then crucified, and then survived, this cult survived, thrived in the face of violent, organized, state-funded resistance. How did that become what you and I know as Christianity would spread around the world? How did that happen? It's one of the great mysteries of history when you, when you look at it. Because there's no human explanation for what occurred with the birth of the church. Historian Karen Armstrong, she writes in her book, Fields of Blood, against all odds, by the third century, Christianity had become a force to be reckoned with. with we still really do not understand how this came about. There's a, there's a mystery. The Bible talks about the church as being a mystery. There's some things I'm going to be able to share with you today and some explanation, and then there's this Incredible, beautiful mystery to the power of the local church. And I know some of you might be thinking, well, that hasn't been my experience. Let me tell you about my experience with the church. I've been damaged by the church. It's a miracle that maybe you're even sitting here today that you're giving church another try. But the vast majority of people I interact with out in society and culture, they've been hurt by the church. They've been abused by the church maybe. That things have happened to them by the church, what people have said to them, programs that have happened, the way manipulations may be been occurred by the church. I mean, we all probably have a story about the church. In fact, the fastest growing population in our culture when it comes to religion is the de-churched. The de-churched. The de-churched person is someone who used to attend church but no longer attends church. Maybe an individual grew up in church but now... I see no value, and I have no need for church. Among our young adults, the fastest-growing demographic is the nuns. So no religious affiliation at all within culture. I, I don't affiliate with any, any religion at all. No affiliation. So the nuns and then the, the de-churched. 
But yet the Bible speaks of something incredibly beautiful. Bart Ehrman in The Rise of Christianity, who's actually an atheist, who spent his whole life being a New Testament scholar. I find that really interesting. But an atheist. He writes this about Christianity. Christianity not only took over an empire, it radically altered the lives of those living in it. It was a revolution. Church, do you feel like you're part of a revolution? It was a revolution that affected government practices. It affected legislation. It affected art. It affected practices. It affected music, philosophy. And even at a more fundamental level, it transformed the way billions of people understood what it means to be a human. The way of Jesus granted dignity and value and worth to every human on the planet. So the way, the way of Jesus. However one evaluates the merit of the case, no one can deny Christianity was the most monumental cultural transformation the world has ever seen. And you and I get to be a part of it. 2,000 years later, you get to be invited to be a part of the greatest movement the world has ever seen. The greatest movement that has the greatest mission statement that the world has ever seen. It continues. Now, what makes the church beautiful? And what is the response to someone who says, I love Jesus but I hate the church. Is that even a possible position to have? I've, a number of conversations I've had with, with, I love Jesus, I like Jesus, but I don't like the church. Well, the church is called the body of Christ, the body of Jesus. So work that out with me. How can you follow Jesus and not be part of his church? So what makes the church, what makes the church beautiful? Ephesians chapter 5 today, verse 25. Be on the screen. If you have a Bible, you can follow along. We're a Bible church. Uh, everything we believe comes from the foundation, the pillar of God's word. So if you don't have a Bible, you can pull up on your device or you can just listen to me read it. Verse 25. This is a passage where Paul is writing from prison. It's like just about everything Paul writes, he's writing from prison. He's writing to Ephesus which is a church made up of very different people. You have Jews, you've got Gentiles in Ephesus. They're all trying to get along, and Paul's writing to them. And he's writing about marriage, but he's writing about the church. He's writing about the church, but he's also writing about marriage. So today we're going to look at it from the context of he's writing about the church. He's writing about the church, which is what? The church is what? The bride of Christ. Jesus is the groom. and You and I, we get to be the bride I want you to think about what the bride does in this passage and what the groom does in this passage. Husbands, love your wives. Now, how are you to love your wife? As Christ loved the church. What did he do for the church? He gave himself up for her. He gave himself up for the church that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. How is the church cleansed? By the washing of water with the word, through the preaching of God's word, through the teaching of God's word, by being immersed in God's word, we're presented as a beautiful bride, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. What has the church done to this point? Nothing. What makes the church beautiful? Not you. Not me. Not the worship. Not the building. Not the programs. Jesus makes the church beautiful. Jesus and Jesus alone makes the church beautiful. The bride of Christ is beautiful, not because the church is beautiful, but because the groom is beautiful. This is really, really important. Because if I don't understand this, the next day, tomorrow, when somebody says something that I'm offended by within the church context, oh, I have the church hurt me, I'm going to leave. That wasn't Jesus. 
Jesus makes the church beautiful. You and I do not make the church beautiful. In fact, I'm going to assume that you and I are going to do everything we can to make the church not beautiful. And then what does Jesus do? He does a lot of hard work throughout this passage, presenting the church as beautiful, washing and cleansing and presenting the the bride of Christ, presenting the church. That is ongoing effort. That's not a one-time deal. And he is really, really busy making the church look beautiful. It's hard work because we do a lot of things to not make the church look beautiful. But at the end of the day, Jesus makes the church beautiful. And he invites you and I to be a part of that. Now, the word church never should have been translated the word church. And this is really an injustice for us because we, we ask questions, hey, are you going to church, right? Are you, am I going to see you at church? What am I saying? Am I going to see you at the building? Am I going to see you at that location? It was actually a German word, church, that got infused in the text. It was never about a building. Jesus never talked about a building or a location. The word ekklesia, the Greek word, is really what it should have been translated. Ekklesia, a gathering of people. An assembly of people. People. Is what Jesus, when he talks about ecclesia, he's talking about the gathering. Are you going to be at the gathering? Are you going to be where all the people are? That's the most important. Not the building. It's the people. The people make up the church. When I was a child, I was taught this in Sunday school. Here's the, oh, I forget it now. Here's the building. Here's the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people, right? Uh, yeah, that's fun. That's cute. Not really biblical, though, because the, the church is not the building. The church is you, and the church is me. You are the church. The first time Jesus uses the reference ecclesia is in Matthew 16, verse 18. And he's speaking to Peter, and he's doing a play on words with Peter. Peter just said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus turns to Peter and he says, Peter, Petro, which is rock. Peter, Petro, Petros is rock. Petros is rock. But he, his, his name is Peter. Peter, upon this stone, upon you, I'm going to build my church. What's he saying? It wasn't Peter. It was the statement that Peter just made. It was the confession of the church that he's going to build the church upon. How is the church built upon? It's by your confession and my confession. When was the last time you shared your testimony? You confess that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. That is, upon, that is what Jesus is building his church upon. He is the builder. Yes, he's also the cornerstone of the church, but he's the builder. Upon this church, I will build my rock. Now listen to the second half of this verse. It's really important. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the powers of death, some translations, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, I've shared this before, but it's worth repeating. Some of us have gates around our house. Are gates offensive or defensive? Some of us put gates up around our place of business. When you put a gate up, what are you doing? You're trying to protect others from coming in. It's a boundary. You're... It's, a, it's for protection that nobody is going to enter in to your area. What does Jesus say about the church? Does Jesus say the church is on the defense? Who's building the gates? The church isn't building gates. Hell's building gates. Why? Because the church is on the move. The church is on the offensive. Is the church on the defense? So too many churches are playing defense. The church is on the move. The church is on the offense. And Jesus says the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The gates of hell cannot stand against the church. Why? Because of Jesus. Because of what Jesus did for the church, because of what Jesus does for the church, what he is ongoing doing with the church. What is he doing without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies He who loves his wife loves himself. Now, you don't hurt your body, right? Generally speaking, we don't hurt our own body. What's Jesus talking about? What's Paul talking about in this passage? What's the body of Jesus? The body of Jesus is the church. 
1 Corinthians 12 talks about this in great detail. And Paul uses the illustration of the body. In 1 Corinthians 12, he says, let's say, if the foot says to the hand, I have no need of you. Now, if your foot starts speaking, let's have a conversation. But Paul is, but what's he doing? He's saying, once you're part of the body, you're part of the body. You don't get to decide that you're not part of the body. You are a part of the body. And amputation is not an option on this one. That's just gross. Don't be gross. You're a part of the church. You are part of the body. You don't get to choose. Number one, you don't get to choose which part of the body. You are part of the body. And he uses the illustration to say the church is my body and all the members of it. And every member plays a different role. And then he goes on to talk about spiritual gifts. That as a follower of Jesus, you have been given through the power of the Holy Spirit, you've been given unique gifts. And some of us are on the sidelines with those gifts. We're not using those gifts. And when that happens, the whole body suffers. Right? You're like, well, I don't, I don't see that. The, the church is suffering when every member of the body is not, not working. We all can share a story of maybe one little part of our body it hurt. For me, it was I broke my finger a number of years ago when I was in college. I had a college job working on a towboat, and I shattered this index finger. And uh, I had put some pins in it and everything. Still to this day, I can't really bend it correctly. Every part of my body hurt and suffered because of one little index finger. I couldn't grab my wallet out of my back pocket. I couldn't put a belt on. I couldn't tie my shoes. I, there were so many things I couldn't do, just one little index finger, right? The same is true in the church. When someone's not using their gifts, when someone's not engaged in the life of the church, the church suffers. And another body part has to work a little harder has to do more, has to get up earlier, has to show up earlier, has to do more. She talks about the engagement of the church. It's the greatest movement in the history of the world. But what was it that caused Christianity to take off? I mean, Jesus predicted his death, right? When he said that to Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not Right? The other disciple, he's like, hey, I, when the church launches, I'm not going to be here. This was one of the greatest prophecies in the New Testament when Jesus predicted the launch of the church. He's like, this isn't going to happen because of me. I'm not going to be here. I will be gone, but it's going on, right? The church has taken off after I take off. Oh, and by the way, Peter, you won't be here either. And Matthew and John, you, you won't be here. You have some writing to do, Matthew, but you're not going to be here, Peter. You have some books to write, but we're going to be gone after we got. That's when it's going to take off. It didn't have a very good start. Uh, i take a few minutes to share with you. My wife and I got married in December of 1996. And if you've heard some horror stories about weddings, I guarantee you it doesn't compare to our wedding story. It took five years before we could even watch the wedding video. It was that bad. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. I'm just going just to tell you. We got locked out of the church. Couldn't get into the church to set up and prepare. We didn't know where the key was. Uh, my wife and all her bridesmaids, they got a traffic ticket on the way to church. Uh, people didn't show up who were supposed to sing solos and run sound. It was an NFL playoff game, which is part of those two things are related there. <laughs> there were so many things that didn't go right. So many things that didn't go right. Didn't start off. Our marriage didn't start off very well. The, the church didn't start off very well. Didn't look very good. But thank goodness the marriage is never dependent upon the wedding. The wedding doesn't determine the success of a marriage. I am so thankful for that. All right? We've had a great marriage by God's grace in spite of a rocky start. The church, the church is only getting stronger. There are people coming to faith all over the world every day, coming to know Jesus. There are organizations that are working all around the world to make sure every village has a church in it. Every village in India, every village in Nepal, every village in China, they've mapped it out, thousands and thousands of villages, and they're making sure that there's gospel preaching church in every corner of the world. 
The church is on the move. The church is on the offense. And my plea to you as your pastor is that the church, that Boulder Mountain Church be on the move. The Boulder Mountain Community Church be on the offensive here in Northeast Mesa. That we never get comfortable. That we never get satisfied with what's going on. I'm so grateful. I shared this in the email this week. Five people in the last two weeks have given their life to Jesus, said yes to Jesus. Recognize, yeah, we can celebrate that. <laughs> Heaven is celebrating that anytime one, but between camp and services, people are giving their life to Jesus. And there's a lot more people who do not know the good news of Jesus, who do not know the hope that Jesus provides. And we have been given an opportunity as the bride of Christ here on this corner. And we may never be satisfied with what God has done, but that he desires to do so much more. You are and I am the body of Christ. What is in Ephesians 5? Let me just summarize what we read in Ephesians 5. What did Jesus do? The church submits to Jesus. He is the head of the church. The elders are not the head of the church. The elders submit to Jesus. I am not the head of Boulder Mountain. Jesus is the head of the church. The deacons are not. We submit to Jesus, who is the head of the church. The church is Christ's body. Jesus is the savior of the church. Jesus loved the church. Jesus gave himself up for the church. Jesus washed the church. Jesus made the church holy. Jesus cleansed the church. Jesus Christ presents the church. Jesus makes the church holy. Christ makes the church blameless. He feeds the church. And yet all of this, Paul says in Ephesians 5, toward the end, he talks about this being It's a mystery. How does this happen? How does a room full of completely dysfunctional and imperfect people, I'm in front of the list on this. When we gather together in Jesus' name, how does that sound so beautiful? How does it look so beautiful? How are the works of a group of imperfect people when we do and serve and give in the name of Jesus? It's transformational. People take notice, and it's attractive. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and two shall become one. This mystery is profound. I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. He keeps going back. This is about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. What did the church do in that passage? Here's the list. You ready? There it is. Jesus has done all the work. We haven't. But yet he invites us in. This is a marriage that knows no divorce. There will not be a day where Jesus says, I'm done with you, church. He has every right to. But he will not. He keeps his promises. He is faithful. We go to Revelation, and he has some words for the church. There's times he disciplines the church. There's times he calls the church out. He says, you are lukewarm. Where's your passion? Where's your confession? Seven churches in the book of Revelation that, that we can read about. It's the greatest movement in the history of the world. If you're grateful for the church, now here's here's where I'm going to challenge you. If you're grateful for the church, if you love the church, be engaged in the church. Where's your role? Where's your part? What what member of the body are, are you? What gifts has God given you? If you like the church, if you benefit from the church, if you enjoy the church, it's time to be engaged in the church. Because here's why I know the church is the hope of the world. Do we call this the church age? This is the age of the church. It's not the age of kings. It's not the age of nations. It's not the age of judges. This is the church age. How is God choosing to reach the world? How is he choosing to communicate? It's through the church. This is how God is choosing to reach the world. It's through the church. And in America, I spent some time sharing some stats with you. Uh, The stats aren't good. 
If I were to tell you that in the next 10 years, 100,000 libraries would close, we would all be, oh my goodness, libraries closing, schools closing. But what's happening, what we're in the middle of right now is 100,000 churches are closing their doors in the United States of America. And what, what's happening, and why is that? Yeah, we have to ask ourselves a question. Are we, are we giving value to the people we're trying to reach? Do they see the value of, of the gospel? What did, what did they grow up in? Some of us grew up, we didn't, we didn't see any excitement. We don't see it. We're seeing the joy of the Lord, and there's no joy. Is that something our young people want to, want to be a part of for the rest of their life, G- give themselves to? In 2019, 4,500 churches closed and 3,000 churches started. That's a neg- negative 1,500 churches in the United States. We're on the verge of becoming Europe. Europe is uh, not just post-Christian. There's, some, there's a small pulse of the church growing again in Europe. What's happening here, churches are closing their doors. Is, is our job as a church, this is your church, this is my church, this is our church, you are the church, to reach Northeast Mesa for the next, for the next 25 years long after I'm gone. For most of us in the room, after we're gone, that there would be a Bible-preaching, gospel-believing church. We're not part of a denomination at Boulder Mountain. We're an independent Bible church, preaches the gospel, preaches grace, preaches that you are loved and what God has for you today is good news of great joy for all people. We believe that that transforms lives. A little bit about Boulder Mountain, our mission statement is we make disciples. You want to know a little bit about Boulder Mountain? Let me just share with you for a couple of minutes. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? An all-in follower of Jesus. Where you're constantly making steps of faith toward Jesus. And I have to tell you, I wish I could share every story Every day there are stories in this church of people taking new steps of following Jesus. Every day there are people doing something they've never done before toward Jesus. It's happening every day. People are giving, people are serving, people are signing up for things they've never been a part of a small group. That's, that's what it means to be a disciple. Now disciple making is messy. My prayer is that we'd be a disciple making church Disciple making is what happens up close and personal over time. It's not a four-week class. Are four-week classes helpful? Yes. But what does it look like for a lifetime of discipleship up close and personal over a long period of time? Follow me as I follow Jesus. What would it look like if a whole church of people did that? If you grabbed a grandson or a granddaughter or a friend or a nephew or a cousin or a coworker, you said, hey, can I sit with you? Can we talk about God's word? Can I disciple you? Would you be open to disciples? You use that word, use whatever word you want to use. Let's grab, go grab coffee. What would it look like if the whole church began to do that? That's what it means to make disciples. As we help people find and follow Jesus. Find Jesus. There are people who they know about Jesus, but they don't know what Jesus came and what he said and what he did. He doesn't know. There are people in our community, they don't know that he can rescue them from the, the pain and the sin of addictions that have gripped their life for decades. There are people within shouting distance of this church who don't know that. And it's our opportunity as Boulder Mountain there. God has given us this day and this time to reach them with the good news of the gospel. To follow Jesus includes all of us, that we would all follow Jesus. To follow is an action. It's a verb. It requires movement. Today, I'm doing things I didn't do yesterday. Tomorrow, I'm going to take a step of faith that I didn't do yesterday. And forgive us when we are so comfortable just consuming content. The American church, one of one of the challenges is anytime we can pull up YouTube, we can listen to a sermon anywhere, anytime, right? And it's great teaching. We can listen to it. We can consume it. But we've become content with consuming content. 
and that's it. We just consume it and we get fat and we're not, we're not doing anything with it. That's not the church that Jesus gave his life for. Love, love God and love people. Take action, like movement. Here at Boulder Mountain, we celebrate. I'm so glad when I mentioned baptisms, there was an applause because, because the church is a little bit of heaven on earth. You want to know what heaven looks like? Go to an active church. When you show up for baptism next Sunday, just a little glimpse of what heaven will be like. It's a celebration. Why? Why do we celebrate? Because what gets celebrated gets repeated. And what's better than one baptism is two baptisms. And it's not about numbers, but every number is a name and every name has a story. Every person has a story. And one story is not better than another. We celebrate. We're a generous church. We're going to say yes as often as we can when there's a need. We're going to be known as a giving church. We're a generous church. Thank you for your generosity. As you give, we're able to meet needs in our community. You're never more like Jesus than when you give and when you serve. Community is really important. Here in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to do three things, but community is really, really important. My prayer is that everybody here would be known. That doesn't mean... You're going to know everybody. There was a day at Boulder Mountain you could know everybody. Let me just warn you, there's going to be a day you don't know everybody. That's okay, as long as everybody is known. That when you show up for the gathering, when you show up for the assembly, you recognize faces, you recognize names, or people who knew and know exactly what happened in your life that week, long before you show up here. Because you're connecting, you're talking, you have friendships. People are not looking for a friendly church. You know what they're looking for? They're looking for friends. What's better than a friendly church is to actually have friends. Most people who say that their church is friendly are people who've been there a really, really long time and they know everybody. Most people are just looking for a friend. Authenticity, transparency. Our young adults today, young people today, they want a church where their parents can can be honest, where people are, are sharing some things that are true. They're willing to confess. They're willing to share something. I don't have this all figured out. Authenticity, not just for the sake of authenticity, but transparency that leads to repentance. Here's where I was. By God's grace, I turned, and this is the work, the transformational work that Jesus has done in my life. We're going to be an honest church, authentic church, a church that celebrates I'm not sharing with you all our statements of belief and faith. Those are on our website, but these are some of the values, who we are as a church. Now I'm asking you to do three things. Three things. What does it mean to be at Boulder Mountain? Number one, who, who are you around during the week? That you could simply say, not just invite them to church, right? Hey, come to my church. Come sit with me. Much more personal. Come sit with me. We, we sit on the third row in the back, right? Come sit with me. I, I want to, let's go together. Let's go to breakfast before. Let's go to the lunch afterwards. Some, some of us, that'd be a huge step of faith to say to somebody who's maybe never been to church before, the church that they heard was a gospel that Jesus never preached. Hey, come sit with me. So that's the first challenge. Number two, find community here at Boulder Mountain. Life, life change most often happens in circles. We're all sitting in rows right now. It's really important that we assemble and gather once a week. That's important. This is a row. You hear teaching. We worship together. It's really important. Don't hear what I'm not saying. It's really important to be in rows. But the most significant life change in my life and maybe in your life we can testify has been in the context of a circle. What's a circle at Boulder Mountain? It's a small group. It's a Bible study. It's a men's group. It's a women's group. It's a young adults group. It's a young couples group. It's a married group. It's a singles group. You, you name the group, get into a group. All the one another's of scripture, there are over 20 one another's of scripture that were, those are all lived out in the context of community. It is really hard for me to do that with all of you. But if we have groups every night of the week where God's word is taught, it's friendships being developed in the context of God's word. It's life-changing. 
So that's number two. Number one, come sit with me. Number two, find community. And number three, engage in the life of the church. Thank you for many of you who are doing that. A lot, lot of volunteers have signed up recently at Boulder Mountain. There's, like, there's something happening here. I want to be a part of it. Every week, there are more opportunities to, to point more children to Jesus. Guest services, tech, worship, to be a part of young couples. If you've been married a long time, there's some young couples just starting out. They could really benefit from you. What gifts do you bring to the table? If you want to, if you don't know, Tuesday, August 6th, we're going to, in this room, we're going to gather together and we're going to develop some small groups and we're going to teach about gifts. Right? So it's an opportunity to build some friendships around some round tables and also to learn about some spiritual gifts. That's Tuesday, August 6th. We're going to do that for four weeks. It'll be a great opportunity to meet some people and learn how God has gifted you. You are the church. When Jesus prophesied about the church, he was prophesying about you. The church, the gates of hell will not stand against you. He's talking about you. You are the church. We are the church. And there's no greater movement. I, I've been so fortunate that God called me to give my life to the local church. The local church. This is, you're like, what's the local church? It's the church that sits on a corner, preaches the gospel, and now upwards of 30 years have been a lot of different types of churches, different sizes of churches. But I love the local church because it's the hope of the world. And this is a, I believe we are positioned. We are positioned. Boulder Mountain. There are thousands of people moving into this area. And some of them never heard the good news of Jesus. And some of them, what they heard wasn't good news. They heard something different, and they are now de-churched. And we have an opportunity to reach them. You need the church, and I need the church. God doesn't need us, but he invites us in. And the church is the most beautiful organization institution that the world has ever seen. Is it broken? Yes. Is it flawed? Yes. But Jesus makes the bride beautiful. I'm not asking you to attend church. I'm asking you to participate and to be engaged in this movement. And I'm going to, I didn't plan to do this, I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And if you feel like you want to be a part of this movement, what God is doing here in Northeast Mesa through a local church, God doesn't promise every local church is going to last forever. But if you sense right now that God is inviting you to be engaged in the life of Boulder Mountain by using your gifts, and you're currently not, would you just raise your hand? Thank you. Thank you. Father, thank you that you have gifted us. It's a gift we didn't earn. It's not a gift we've received. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. You've given us unique gifts to be used to help people find and follow Jesus. And I, I pray that you would make, bring clarity for those who raise their hands, that you'd bring clarity as to what that looks like. Father, we pray for uh, the baptisms next week. I pray for August 4th as we invite Northeast Mesa here on that Sunday that uh, we, we would do everything we can to get out of the way for what you want to do in this place. We ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for those who raised your hand. And, and let me just encourage you. Uh, you can email the office. Uh, in the program, there's an email address. It says admin at Boulder Mountain CC. And it can simply be, hey, I, I want to serve. I just don't know where to serve yet. Uh, can you share with me a list of some opportunities to serve? I'd be happy to do that. We want to walk with you. I'd be happy to sit down with you and, 
and share with you some of the opportunities. But again, mark your calendars. August 6th, that Tuesday, we're going to spend some time teaching about spiritual gifts and forming some new, new small groups. All right. Would you stand for worship? I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment and let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.